Greetings from Stanford University. I'm Bill Barnett, professor at the Graduate School of Business and the Stanford Door School of Sustainability. I'm Ingrid Ackerman, an undergrad in the School of Engineering. And we have with us here today, Chris Larson, uh, entrepreneur, uh, a pioneer of uh, democratizing finance, uh, and uh, now an activist working for the benefit of sustainability. And That's Eric nice. Haar, who is the founder and CEO of the Laudate Si Challenge Foundation. Uh, Chris, Eric, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Bill. Absolutely. And, you know, we just concluded the 2023 Climate Impact Summit, which the Stanford Door School of Sustainability and the Stanford Graduate School of Business hosted uh, along with um, uh, the Holy See, uh, an event with the Vatican. And uh, I'd love it if you guys could just describe what it is we did today. Yeah, well, I think uh, clearly uh, climate is the biggest challenge the world's ever faced. Uh, we are very, very late to the game. So I think just about every institution now really needs to be not just asking what, what they're doing with their institutions, but also what can they do to push forward these solutions that we have to find uh for the greater good as quickly as possible and um in sort of my climate work um i, I had the honor to visit uh the holy see the vatican last september and uh, that was an event sponsored by the ladato si challenge to uh among several other issues talk about climate and I didn't know what to expect. I'd, I'd never been there before. Uh, I, I'm I'm a Buddhist. I'm not a Catholic, so you know I didn't know what to expect. But I came away really inspired that uh, the Holy See is uh, very serious and very knowledgeable about the climate challenge that we face, and particularly uh, the challenge uh, with climate in the global South, which is something that is um, equally important that we we are front and center about. And so uh, we wanted to do more, and uh, we suggested a, an additional summit. And uh, you know, since I have you know background here with Stanford, having been you know gone here many decades ago, but also with the Stanford Business School Advisory Council, you know, this idea now that uh, we're going to have this fantastic, or already do, sustainability school, that just seemed like something that the Holy See talks about. The climate challenge uh, is about bringing together unlikely alliances. Mm -hmm. It seemed like, yeah, Holy See and Stanford and Silicon Valley, that's, uh, those are pretty unlikely alliances. Let's explore on whether or not there's something that we might be able to work together on and uh, further this, uh, this great challenge of uh, solving climate. Yeah, that's incredible. Uh, Eric, what's your reflection on the day? Well, I, first, thanks for having me. I feel like I'm going to be working for you one day, Ingrid, so I'll submit my LinkedIn bio to you so you can hire me in 10 years. Um, it's, uh, I think a lot of this, Bill, is that um, we have much more in common than we think. And I was really struck today by the data that Dr. Krosnick put forward that we're not all that dissimilar on these issues. Um, and that bridges can form when you sit down and have honest alignment and authentic discussion about what you're trying to do. I was really inspired by that. Um, and uh, when I was in at the Vatican, I was asked if I knew what the word pontifex meant. It's Latin for Pope. I was embarrassed to know I didn't know what it meant. It means bridge maker. I think that's a great role that Pope Francis sees for himself. And when you when you build bridges between unlikely allies, you can co-create the solutions that can actually help us all win. Right. Private sector can win. Public sector can win. Faith sector can win. So I was really struck by uh, the sense of fraternity and solidarity in the room. We have a very distinct and diverse group of people here today. And it was amazing to me that when you sit down and almost break bread with people, you realize that you can have those small wins. And those are the things that can bridge the left-right 
divide, which is I know is important to Chris and I know it's important to Pope Francis. And so I was really struck with, we actually have quite a bit in common. And now the question is, how do we work as unlikely allies to win the climate fight? Um, and, and that really was the big takeaway. Another deeply inspiring point for me, and this relates to Chris, is that he recognizes that carbon removal can be one of the greatest financial opportunities in history. But how do we distribute that in a way that is that is in a just way to the global south? That's extraordinary. And you need a leader in Silicon Valley who has the humility to say it shouldn't all be captured here. It should be distributed. So that was a big takeaway for me as well. Yeah. You know, again, I thought there was uh, a lot of potential here to sort of work together. But I think going in, we also recognize that there are obstacles, right? Mm -hmm. And one of them is, uh, you know, these are very different cultures, right? Yeah. So uh, the culture of Silicon Valley is one of, uh, you know, moving fast, embracing failure, which is a good thing and unusual, um, but also maybe a little bit overconfident in, uh, you know, being constantly pivoting until you figure something out, mm -hmm. uh, right? And clearly we create amazing things in Silicon Valley, but we're also we're we're pretty dismissive about institutions that work and uh, you know survive the test of time, um, and we're very blind to the negative consequences of the things that we make. Uh, just witness social media and the damage it's done to demo our democracy and young folks and and such. So that's Silicon Valley culture. Holy See culture, in some ways, couldn't be more different, right? It's uh, oldest institution on earth. It has um, guarded its you know, primary focus for centuries. Um, you know, it, it it's very risky for that institution to be changing things rapidly and, and association associating with projects that may not make any sense. So that's two very different things. Um, but at the same time, um, there's something neat about Silicon Valley's uh, call to action, right? It's a place of action rather than talking. And I think actually what I've learned is um, the Holy See, certainly with Pope Francis is also oriented towards action and not just talking. So there's some space there to work with. And, and, that's a, and that's a good thing. And that is why we sort of, to Eric is mentioning a couple of issues we focused on. That's why we decided to focus on two very specific issues in this thousand front war that is climate change, you know, the climate challenge. And that was first bridging the left-right climate divide. Why is climate a culture war issue? It makes no sense, yet we have it. Uh, and then second is um, an area that doesn't get enough attention in climate. We can't just be getting to zero. We have to do that. But we're way late here. We've got to also take out maybe 500 billion tons to a trillion tons over the next few decades just to get back to a normal world. And uh, that actually doesn't get enough attention. Um, the other side of that, though, is that that's probably going to be one of the biggest industries ever, if it works. That's right? the carbon dioxide removal industry. Yeah, just trillions of dollars, yeah. right? Uh, so that's not just a challenge and a need to help the earth, as, or as the Holy See would say, the cry of the earth. But it's also potentially uh, a chance to do something else the Holy See is, wants to do, which is the cry of the poor. And that's focusing on mm -hmm. the global south. So wouldn't it be neat if you can solve actually solve the uh, climate crisis with a very economical, effective carbon dioxide removal industry. And if we scaled and innovated correctly in the global south, now that becomes a huge wealth generator that helps solve the cry of the poor. Okay, that's pretty aligned with Stanford and Holy See's objectives. That'd be pretty cool. And, so, and along those lines, there's this framework often used in negotiation that's interest, options, and objective criteria. And I think it can be applied when we look at climate change, because what we found out today is that all of our interests are actually much more aligned than we thought they are, but we're wasting a ton of our energy fighting back and forth on semantics. Yes. We're burning our time, we're burning our energy, and we're not focusing on the options and how we create this market, get carbon taxes in place, et cetera. And so I think a, a big point of this conference was talking about communication in general and how do we move past interests and move on to options and start implementing these things. Yeah, you got a lot of stuff to unpack there that's spot on, right? So a lot of this, weirdly, this is a, this is a language problem. This is a, a, the language of diplomacy problem, right? And, and again, I'll turn to Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is terrible at diplomacy. I mean, think about the 
idiotic words we use in Silicon Valley, right? Move fast and break things. Obviously, we know that's ridiculous. It's a joke line. We still brag about disruption. And we brag, uh, you know, like I'm going to use a quote for somebody I admire tremendously, you know, the put a dent in the universe, Steve Jobs, he meant that as a good thing and he delivered. But a lot of people don't get that right. I mean, put a dent in the, you put it down my car, that's not a good thing, right? So uh, there are language isn't right. That's the language of teenagers, not diplomats, right? And this is, I think, again, bridging with the Holy See. The Holy See is actually spectacular mm -hmm. at diplomacy, right? And what we need in the climate fight is a lot more diplomacy. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, people on the left or in the environmental movement, they're many times they're against carbon dioxide removal because I think they're they're confusing it maybe with uh, carbon capture and sequestration, which may or may not be bad. We don't know yet. Um, but it's too aligned with the oil companies, perhaps, right? So it's the the labels, the language that is getting in the way. And we spend all this time talking to our camps rather than bridging the divide. And if we start looking at the numbers, as was presented here by one of the Stanford uh, professors who's done a ton of research, the actual numbers are not that far off between mm -hmm. left and right. It's a lot of it comes down to, well, what do you now do about it, right? Mm -hmm. So we need to be giving space to each side. Each side needs to give a little bit, maybe get a little bit of a beachhead and then get a bigger beachhead. And, and that's how we're you know, hopefully gonna solve this problem. Yeah, you know, that's, uh, I'm glad you say that, Chris. And, you know, one of the things we learned was that many people as uh, well-informed as they might be, don't really know the difference between the carbon dioxide removal industry, which is just taking off, and many other related industries. Um, uh, 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 Chris or Eric, either of you, uh, for our listeners, could you just sort of sum up in in a in a in a paragraph what is that about maybe with an example well carbon dioxide removal you're right it's a new industry a ton of really interesting projects of which we saw a whole number of them here today but none of them has have scaled yet there is no solar panels or batteries or evs of carbon dioxide removal right those are three things that have scaled and now they're taken off the numbers are awesome but we don't have that yet in carbon dioxide removal I mean, basically what it is, it's it's kind of accelerating what the world does in many cases. I mean, the world will fix our carbon problem. The problem isn't going to take like thousands of years. Mm -hmm. So can you develop technologies, maybe using natural materials like olivine rock? We heard, heard that today with the ocean uh, alkalinity enhancement. Um, that's kind of doing what the earth does in a thousand years, doing it maybe a ten years, right? Uh, or we we heard from Air, Heirloom, phenomenal company. Uh, full disclosure, I'm an investor, but awesome, you know, objectively awesome, uh, which is uh, doing a similar thing with uh, limestone uh, and greatly accelerating, uh, you know, what the world would already do naturally, right? So that's a those are good solutions, right? Because they are just removing the CO2. We have too much CO2 in the air. Mm -hmm. We've dumped too much CO2 in the air. Uh, and we need to take it out. Some people, uh, famous Klaus Lackner, a, a tremendous long-term climate advocate scientist, he describes this as it's a waste disposal problem. Mm -hmm. So this is as if we were living in the world before sanitation, how awful that was. And we sort of have to have a sanitation industry for all the carbon we've dumped. That's kind of what yeah. it is, right? It's highest level. But then there, there's other versions of it that some of the oil companies champion, uh, that's CCS, right? Carbon capture and sequestration. That's basically, okay, I'm, I'm burning natural gas and I'm just gonna strip out as much of the CO2 at right, the smokestack as I can. Maybe that can work. Maybe some of that's positive. There's a great skepticism mm -hmm. that that is maybe just a head fake by the oil and gas companies just to placate things in commercials and they're not really serious about it. We'll see. Um, but again, there are different flavors. I'd say the CDR stuff, we just talked about the ocean alkalinity enhancement folks, the heirlooms of the world. Um, they are absolutely climate warriors. They're trying to fix the problem mm -hmm. from scratch to start a, a massive industry. And uh, they're going to face tremendous challenges. But if they make it, it could be the thing that saves us. And one of the things that they kept asking for was help 
from the government in terms of getting a carbon tax in place and or just more financial incentives to make this the big industry that it can become. And that kind of circles back to our bigger problem of just communication and aligning interests and getting everyone kind of on the same page. Um, yeah, that's a good point, Ingrid. You know, uh, it, you, we were talking about some of these examples, uh, Chris, that you just mentioned. I was blown away by the uh, by the ocean based uh, examples. Uh, for example, there was Ocean Visions, for example, and it's not the only one, but but we all know the ocean uh, naturally, as as you pointed out, these are just uh, many of these are natural processes already. The ocean absorbs a tremendous amount of carbon dioxide, but but by uh, uh, altering uh, the nature of, of absorption in uh, the plants in the ocean, uh, some of these um, proposals would increase carbon dioxide uh, uh, removal by orders of magnitude. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and, and this is potentially very important for, uh, for our future. Absolutely, and one thing that illuminated me today was the urgent need to scale these rapidly. Peter Miner made a good point that we can't rush it. We've got to do it right. We've got to be sensitive to the consequences of our actions, but we also need to move fast. We're talking about removing more carbon each year than the oil and gas industry pulls out of the, the earth every year. So how do you scale? And what you do is Chris had a great play on Pope Francis's words of answering the cry of the earth, the cry of the poor. Chris Larson said, let's answer the cry of the now. Uh, and who better to help scale these solutions than the global Catholic Church. This is the greatest soft power and distribution network in the world. They can help these entrepreneurs scale. And in his 2015 encyclical letter, Laudato Si, Pope Francis called on that. He didn't want this encyclical to languish in the Vatican archives. As a Jesuit Pope, he wanted it to live and breathe and have the young people take action and support right? The Ingrids of the world, we need to rise up behind them. So who better as a partner than the Vatican to clear a lot of those policy roadblocks or government roadblocks or distribution roadblocks that the entrepreneurs today were, were talking about? That's why it's such a, a match made in heaven. Well, that's incredible. That's incredible. Well, uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for coming and meeting with us today and and for uh, bringing uh, Laudato Si and, and this uh, conference to Stanford University and we hope to see you here in the years to come as well as we together uh, try to tackle uh, the world's great challenge. Well, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having us. Absolutely. Thanks, Absolutely. So on behalf of uh, uh, Stanford University, the Stanford Door School of Sustainability and the Stanford Graduate School of Business, I want to thank all of you listeners. Until next time. The Stanford Initiative on Business and Environmental Sustainability podcast series is sponsored by the Stanford Graduate School of Business and the Stanford Door School of Sustainability. Music by Charged Particles. That's Caleb Hutzler, Mike Rock, and John Krosnick.